Thank you for joining us for this week's episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. Last week, we began looking into what I believe is one of the most important things for us as Christians to understand, and that is that we are involved uh, in a cosmic battle in a realm that is unseen to us. One of the devil's greatest tricks that keeps us from experiencing the fullness of all that God wants to do from us is to keep us blinded to the truth that there's a battle going on in this unseen realm. Um, these, these cosmic powers in heavenly places, as the scripture we looked at last week called them. So um, we started digging in a little bit to the spiritual warfare. There are three things that we, we looked at last week. First of all, is that the struggle is real. There really is a battle. In fact, the people that you think are your enemies are not your enemies. Your enemies are not people. Your enemies are not things. Your animal, enemies are not things you see with your eyes and touch with your hands or hear with your ears. Uh, your enemies are not in the physical realm. Uh, the verse we looked at and last week and that we'll look at again today in Ephesians 6 tells us that we're not wrestling with flesh and blood. We're not wrestling with people. Those people that irritate you, those people who oppose you, uh, those people who are your enemies, who say bad things about you, those people who disagree with you or with whom you disagree, they're not really your enemies. There's something behind what they are doing. There's someone behind what they're doing. They're, they're, there's unseen warfare that's being waged. The struggle is real. Second thing we looked at is that our enemy is crafty. Uh, the devil's smart. He's not dumb. Now, he's not omniscient like God is nor is he omnipotent or omnipresent. He's not in any way, shape, or form anywhere close to being God. He is already a defeated enemy. Uh, there really, in, in a sense, there really is no spiritual battle uh, because the battle is over. But there is still the struggle. And we struggle with a very clever enemy, and that's what we're going to look at today. How the devil in this unseen arena manages to attack us and to wage war against us, maybe even in ways we're not even understanding that's what's going on. Uh, but the third thing we looked at last week is that victory is inevitable. God has given to us um, tremendous tools. Uh, Paul told the Corinthian church, the weapons of our warfare are not physical. They're not fleshly. They are mighty in God. And so God has equipped us uh, with some wonderful tools to wage uh, this struggle, to defend in this struggle, uh, to go on the offensive in this struggle, and to be his soldiers, and to win victory for his glory and for his honor. But today we're going to look at our enemy. What is it about this devil? The devil isn't a cute little red guy with a pointed tail and horns that breathes fire. He's not a cute little cartoon character. He is a very real enemy who is out to uh, if you are not born again, he is out to prevent you from being born again, although he can't. Um, but he wants to he wants to uh, deceive you. He wants to um, discourage you. He wants to destroy you uh, and, and defeat you. Um, but we have victory uh, through the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to look at our enemy today and understand where is he coming from? I hope it'll give you some awareness, maybe of some things that are happening in your life. You didn't realize why they were happening. And uh, we'll look at two strategies the devil has. And we'll look at three vulnerable areas that we have that he often attacks. So uh, let's pray and then we'll dig back into our scripture. And uh, we'll be back in Ephesians chapter six. So join me as we pray. Thanks be to you, our Heavenly Father, for you have given us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Through his perfect life, his death for us on the cross, his glorious resurrection, but the filling of your Holy Spirit in our lives, the sealing of our lives with your Spirit, through the promise of your coming again to set all things back right, we, we stand today in victory if we are in Christ. There is no question about it. It is not a contended battle. It's over. It's finished, though we still struggle. So, Lord, I pray that you would help us to understand who we're struggling against and that we would stand in the power of your might, not our own, and that we would stand firm, knowing that our victory has already been purchased for us through the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus, and appropriated to us when we believed and when we became yours. 
So guide us in this study, enlighten our eyes, and help us to see your glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So join me as we turn our attention back to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6 is where uh, we've been looking uh, at this spiritual battle that we have. Let's take a moment and just look over these three verses again. We'll go further in the chapter in the coming weeks, but today let's look at this. Finally, Paul said, be strong in the Lord. Isn't that a great word? Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Our success uh, in this struggle is not based on our own ability. It's not based on our own resources, but we are strong and strengthened through his might. Well, since God is uh, omnipotent, uh, that means he has all power, all strength, all might, then the resources from which we draw to wage this warfare and to engage the struggle is absolutely unlimited. And that's a positive thing. So spiritual warfare is not something to be afraid of or to cower away from. We just need to understand it and understand where our strength lies and to tap into that. He says, to put on the whole armor of God uh, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, the schemes. That's what we're going to look at today. What is the devil doing? What are his plans? What is his strategy? And as I said, we're going to look at two strategies that he has, and then we're going to consider three vulnerabilities that you and I have, that those strategies, uh, where he tends to employ those strategies. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. Notice who he says, rulers, authorities, cosmic powers over this present darkness, spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. It's the unseen realm I'm talking about. So it's not the seen realm, it is the unseen realm in which we do battle. So let's dig into this and, and see, let's talk about these schemes of the devil. Uh, the devil is not very original, okay? Uh, he is not one that has um, come up with all these clever plans and uh, adapts to generations as they come. He's been up to the same tricks ever since the Garden of Eden. So let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Now, theologically, we call this the fall of mankind. This is where sin was introduced into the world. God had created a perfect world. And now, because of man rebelling against God, disobeying God, sin, the curse of sin, is introduced into this creation. So let's read about it. Now, the serpent, and that's, by the way, the serpent is the devil in disguise. The serpent, what was he? He was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, did God actually Say now, I, I want us to highlight that. Did God actually say? Because the first scheme that we see is that God is that the devil wants us to be unclear about the Word of God. Now there are several ways this happens. First of all. Um, we're ignorant about God's word. We don't study it. We don't read it. We don't know what's there. We we just depend on other people to tell us what is there. In fact, sometimes I believe biblical truth in our lives is gossip. Now, yeah, what I mean by that is the only biblical truth we get is what somebody else tells us. We don't go to the source and find out about it ourselves. We're ignorant about the word of God. Um Another way is we neglect God's word. We know what it says. We just don't do it. Uh, we don't like what it says. Um, I came across a social media post the other day on a particular issue, and I won't say what the issue is because it doesn't really matter, and I don't want us to go down that rabbit hole. But um, about this particular issue, the very first comment that a commenter made on the social media post was, I know God has no problem with this, but I do, or I know God is okay with this, but I'm not, I think was actually the way he put it. And I shuddered when I saw that. I thought, does, does this dude realize what he's saying? 
He is saying that, you know, you know, God doesn't express opinion. Let me repeat that. God does not express opinion. What you read in the Bible is not God's opinion. It is truth. It is the way it is. So what this man was saying is that his opinion was more valid than God's truth. Now, if I were to, if I, I didn't know the man that made the comment, but if I did know him and I engaged him in, in conversation, I said that, well, that's not what I was saying at all, but it was. I know God doesn't have a problem with this. God's truth is A, but I am B, or I am negative A. Um. And so we just neglect it. We know the Bible, and it, my, my church members will tell you, my pastoral pet peeve, I know the Bible says, but. Um, that's the wrong conjunction. I know the Bible says, so. You know, I mean, we don't, there is no contrary. I know the Bible says, and then if we're going a different direction from what we know the Bible says, we are in error, we are, we are disobedient, we are in sin. So we're either ignorant of God's word, we don't really study it, Um Look around sometime when you're in church and, and notice how many people don't have a Bible <laughs> in church. There are people who go to uh, Sunday morning Bible study classes and leave their Bibles behind. Um, besides that, there are people who during the course of the week seldom pick up their Bible. So we're ignorant of the Bible. We know what the Bible says and we neglect it. Or three, we misuse the Bible. And I'm going to be real careful not to go off on a tangent here because this is what I'm just really passionate about lately is that people like to take a Bible verse out of context and use it to prop up their favorite cause. Uh, for instance, uh, I'll just give you an example. Um, there's a political leader you don't like, all right? Um, and you wish that political leader wasn't even in office. You wish... He or she had not been elected. And there's a verse in Psalms. I forget the exact verse now, but it's um, may his days in office be few and may another uh, take his place. It, Jesus' disciples use that passage of Scripture to refer to Judas Iscariot and finding the replacement for Judas Iscariot. But in its original context in the Psalms, it wasn't talking about a, a, a democratically elected leader that just happened to be from the other side as you or that made decisions you didn't like. And so that's playing fast and loose with the word of God. Uh, or recently uh, there've been memes all over Facebook where there's a passage in Deuteronomy about sojourners coming in and living in your land and being successful and being more successful than the inhabitants of the land. And you go to them to buy food and, and they, they apply that to today's um, illegal immigration crisis, which is a crisis, but that verse does not apply to that. And so what happens is then we feel like we, the word of God, then we, we become the curator of the word of God. We make the word of God mean what we want it to mean rather than letting the word of God inform us and shape us. We use the word of God like a hammer on other people rather than using the word of God like a chisel in our own heart or sandpaper in our own heart. That's right up the devil's alley. He wants us to either ignore God's word neglect God's word or be ignorant of God's word, not know it, not study it, not read it, uh, or neglect God's word, know what it says, but just refuse to obey it. Or, or when we do use it to play fast and loose with it, um, you know, the Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, taking stuff like that out of context and, you know, naming and claiming stuff because of that. And that's not what God's word says. We play right into the devil's schemes when we do that. So, that's what he he wanted. He wanted Eve. Did God actually say this? And what he said was completely wrong. God did not say, you shall not eat of any tree of the garden. In fact, God said the opposite, almost. You can eat of every tree in the garden except one. And his rule for that, which is going to get us to our second scheme in just a minute, his rule for that was for Adam and Eve's own good the knowledge of good and evil would destroy them. And 
all of a sudden, Eve got to thinking, well, no, that's not what he said. But then look at, let's look at strategy number two. Not only does he want us to be unclear about the word of God, but number two, uh, he wants us to question God's goodness or, and you could say either one, sufficiency. But God is enough. Look at how he did that. The serpent said to the woman, you'll not surely die. She said, God said that as soon as we eat it, we'll die. God did, in fact, say that. The serpent contradicted what God said. Oh, you're not going to die. God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. In other words, God's holding back, holding back something from you. God is not good. God doesn't have your best interest at heart. God's God's man, God's God's like a ball and chain in your life. You'll forget this God stuff. You listen to me, man. God won't run your life anymore. You'll run your life. Have you ever noticed something? Talk about wanting to run your life. You take the letter I and you add it to run. And you get ruined. When I think I can run my life, I ruin my life. But the devil wants us to question God's goodness. Well, you know, does God really love me? And this gets back to, 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 to number one. If we know God's word, yes, we know. And we have verses that we can go to. In fact, when Jesus was tempted by the devil, you can look at Matthew chapter four. Every time the devil came at Jesus, and a couple of those times he was misusing God's word. But when the devil came at Jesus, every time, Jesus handled the devil's attack with the truth of God's word. He quoted scripture. When we know the word of God, when we study it, when it, we, we live by it and it shapes us and we memorize it, we are equipped to repel everything the devil throws at us. And one of the things he's going to throw at us is to try to get us to, 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 to doubt God's goodness or that God is enough. We have to help God out. That God's way by itself is not enough. God's lucky to have us. And that I know God said that, so I'm just going to help God out. We try to open some of the doors God has closed, or we try to shut some of the doors that God has flung open, or whatever the case may be. The devil wants us, first of all, to be fuzzy about the Word of God. That's why it is my passion in life to encourage Christians to read, to study the Word of God every day. Read it for yourself. Don't let the word of God and the truth of God's word, don't receive it only as gossip. Go to the source yourself. Don't neglect it. Obey it. Don't misuse it. Keep it in its context. It is, the Bible says it is a sharp two-edged sword. When you start slinging that thing around carelessly, you're going to do some cutting, maybe even cut yourself and harm yourself. So handle it with care. Don't fall into the devil's tracks or his schemes. Don't fall for his schemes. Don't be unclear about the word of God. Don't question God's goodness or sufficiency. Now, what areas in our life, real quickly, what areas in our life are we vulnerable? We see that in this dialogue between the serpent or the result of the dialogue between the serpent and Eve. The woman saw three things. One, that the tree was good for food. Two, that it was a delight to the eyes. And three, to be desired to make one wise. So she took of the fruit and ate. And she gave some to her husband who was with her. And he ate. Three vulnerabilities. I have them. You have them. We all have them. First vulnerability is our flesh. what we feel. She saw the tree was good for food. Now, did she need, was she about to starve and had all the other sources for food dried up in the garden? No, she was greedy. She didn't, she was questioning God's goodness and sufficiency. What God had given was not enough. There was something out there that may be better. 
than what God had provided. And she wanted it. That's why sexual sin is so dangerous. That's why sins like gluttony uh, are, are so dangerous. That's why addictions are dangerous. They appeal to the to how we feel. They, they alter how we feel and, and the flesh about us. So we have to watch out about the temptations of the flesh. Secondly, we are vulnerable in our eyes. It was a delight to the eyes. What we see, we start looking around instead of looking up. We stop looking around instead of looking in. Uh, whenever we're not looking in and evaluating our own life and looking up at God, we're looking around at what others have, we get jealous. Um, man, I really would like to have that. Or we're tempted, you know, that's why pornography is a temptation. It appeals to the flesh and to the eyes. Man, it works two of these together. Um, be careful what you look at. Be careful where you let your eyes go. Be careful the books you read. And, you know, I would, I would add, not adding to the word of God, but just by experience, I would say not just our eyes. Be careful with your ears. Be careful what you hear. What we see and what we hear can affect, they can affect our attitudes if we're not careful. We can just get off in some bad attitudes that lead us into sin. So guard your flesh, guard your eyes. And then the third vulnerability we have is our pride. It was desired to make one wise. What she knew and the, the potential that she had for knowledge, the truth that God would teach her, she was not content um, with what God had given. She wanted more. This is what we want. And what we want, particularly for ourselves and of ourselves, what we want people to think about us. God had promised to fellowship with them. God had promised to tell them everything they needed to know. They this this is where we have to be careful of the sin of discontentment. We want other people to look at us. We want how it's basically how others view us. We worry about that. We worry more about what others think of us than what God thinks of us. But look, there's a truth. God is glorious. God's, God's opinion is the only opinion that matters the most. And since his opinion is the opinion that matters the most, why does it really matter what others think? And so we're tempted to do things that make us look better rather than finding our identity in Christ, finding our contentment, our satisfaction in Christ in our relationship with God. So you see, the devil is tricky. He wants to make us fuzzy about God's word. So get in God's word and know it, memorize it, study it for yourself. Don't just depend on your, your, your pastor to feed you. Don't watch all these TV preachers. Quit going to all these religious um, social media accounts and, Sometimes we get so many different voices coming in our mind. We just, it, it fuzzes. Go to the word of God yourself. And then let your pastor be your primary shepherd. And then if you want to supplement with some of these others, then fine. But primarily, you and God's word. And secondarily, the shepherd that God has placed in your life for your spiritual maturity. And then supplement with others. Don't be fuzzy about God's word. Be careful how you, don't. Don't try to be cute with the Bible. Uh, don't don't try to use it for your pet. Uh, pro Let the Bible speak for itself. Don't force it to speak for what you want it to speak for. Um, and then, you know, not only God's word, but don't question God's goodness and sufficiency. He is enough. He's given you everything that you need. James 1 tells us every good gift and perfect gift uh, comes down from the Father of lights. So know that God has given you everything. He's good. He's sufficient. Watch your flesh. Now be careful about things that appeal to how you, that, that feel good. 
and that you you want them because they make you feel good. Let Christ bring you joy better than things that bring you fuzzy feelings. Watch what you see and what you hear, where your eyes and ears lead you. And, and then, you know, be honest enough with yourself to check your pride. You get to worrying too much about what other people think about you and how they see you. And you worry less about what God thinks and how God sees you. So this has been helpful. We got a very real enemy who's smart. Uh, we're going to see, we're going to come back to these strategies and these vulnerabilities as we work through the tools that God has given us. We look at the armor of God. We're going to see how the armor protects our vulnerabilities and uh, how the tools that God gives us helps us to defend ourselves uh, against his strategies. So um, stay tuned. But in the meantime, get in God's word. Know what's there. Start knowing the real stuff in God's word so that when the devil starts throwing junk at you, you'll recognize it for the junk that it is. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time.